Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your life-giving spirit. And we pray now that as we turn to your word, that your spirit would be at work in our hearts, helping us to believe your gospel and bring forth his fruit in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what are the marks that someone has been changed by God's Spirit? What are the marks that someone has been changed by God's Spirit? I think the rise of the charismatic movement has meant that when many of us think of the marks of the Holy Spirit, what immediately comes to mind is the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so the Spirit-filled life is often equated with speaking in tongues and prophecies and contemporary music, uh, miraculous healings and things like these. Uh, and so the Spirit's work is very easily equated with a supernatural kind of experience that results in blessing and abundance and success and prosperity, or, or perhaps the emotions that we feel as we go to church. Now, of course, this, the gifts of the Spirit, if we rightly understand them and practice them, there's, uh, they're a good thing, and there's nothing wrong with that. But such a focus on the gifts of the Spirit can easily distract us from a far more important and foundational work of the Spirit in our lives. And that is the work of changing our hearts to believe in Christ and to be led into holiness. So as we come this morning to Galatians chapter 5, uh, may God's Word reorient our hearts and our minds to focus, I guess, in the right place how God's Spirit is at work in our lives, shaping our character and bringing forth His fruit. And my aim this morning is that we will all be able to, to pause amidst the busyness of our lives, to do some honest reflection on our Christian life, to ask ourselves, does my life show that I am a child of God? Is my character being increasingly molded and shaped to be like the Lord Jesus? Uh, supremely, am I growing in love for others? Or does my life suggest I'm not yet one of God's people because instead of the fruit of the Spirit, it's actually the works of the flesh that dominate my life? Now, uh, because the lectionary takes us uh, here and there each week, let me just remind ourselves of the context of Galatians 5 so we can make sure we understand this passage as God intends. And in the book of Galatians, Paul is addressing a false gospel that has been spreading among the Galatian churches that he planted during his first missionary journey. Some false teachers have come to the Galatian churches saying that faith in Christ is not enough. They're saying, unless you are circumcised, according to the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. And, and so although these Christians had started well, they were already beginning to accept this false teaching and go back to following the Old Testament law. And, and Paul says in this letter, they're in grave danger of falling away from grace and losing their salvation. And so in chapters 1 and 2, Paul has argued from his own conversion. In chapters 3 and 4, he's argued from the Old Testament that we've only ever been justified by faith. That is, it is those who hear the gospel and believe it who are declared right with God, who uh, receive God's spirit, who enter into God's family. It's not those who add works to faith. It's not those who go back to the Old Testament law. And so he's urged them, to stand firm in the freedom of the gospel and to put their faith alone in Christ alone. But as we come now to chapter 5, Paul wants us to see the right place of good works in the Christian life. He wants us to understand that while our good works never contribute to our salvation, they are the necessary fruit that flows from a life that has been changed by God's Spirit and so the fruit of the Spirit become a key indicator of whether our life has been changed by God's Spirit or not. So the first thing we see in this passage is that freedom from the law doesn't mean freedom to sin. Freedom from the law doesn't mean freedom to sin. Paul says in verse 1, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of 
of slavery. So again, it's very important that we're clear. We're not saved by our works. We can't get to heaven by our moral performance or by keeping the law. Going back to that kind of life is what Paul calls slavery. Because if going to heaven is based on moral performance, you can never be sure that you're good enough. It's always do, 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 but it's never enough. Uh, maybe I need to do more. Or it's all, you know, I do, 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 and then it's fail, fail, fail. I never do it perfectly. And we're told here that Christ has freed us from all of that, that enslaving life of moral performance by fulfilling the law on our behalf and on the cross dying to take the punishment we deserve for, for breaking God's law. Christ has set us free. We're free from the law, we're free from God's punishment, and we're free from a life of moral performance. But Paul knows there's always a temptation for Christians to go back to slavery, you know, to start off trusting in Jesus, but then to, to add works back onto faith, to start thinking to myself, well, if I do this, then God will be happy to me. Or if I, if I don't do that, oh, God's going to not be uh, happy with me anymore. See, there's always a temptation, like there was for the Galatian Christians, to leave behind the true gospel and go instead for what we might call gospel plus. You know, gospel plus my moral performance. Gospel plus my good works. Gospel plus my church attendance and my baptism and my ministry and my evangelism and my being a good person and all of that. And instead of being free, we find ourselves enslaved once again. And we put ourselves in danger of falling from grace and losing our salvation. But it's also possible to swing to the other extreme. And that is to say that now that I'm a Christian, my life doesn't matter anymore. Because after all, I'm saved by grace. My good works don't contribute to my salvation. And so it doesn't matter how I live. And so Paul wants us to be clear here that freedom from the law doesn't mean freedom to sin. He says in verse 13, For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So as Christians, we're free. We're free from moral performance. We're free from the law. We're free from a life of earning our way to heaven. But we are not free to sin. We're not free to live however we want, as if it doesn't matter. Because we're freed for a purpose, to glorify God, to serve one another in love. Uh, a previous uh, pastor of mine, Joshua Ung, he explained it in this way. Uh, in Harry Potter, there's a character named Dobby. I think there's a picture I've got in the slides. And he was freed by Harry Potter from being a slave to the evil Malfoy family. And once he's freed, Dobby says this. He says, Dobby is a free house elf. And he can obey anyone he likes. And Dobby will do whatever Harry Potter wants him to do. See, that's, that's like us, right? Jesus has freed us. We don't have to do things in order to earn our way to heaven or to inherit eternal life. We are free, like Dobby was freed. But now that we have been freed from our slavery to sin, we willingly and joyfully give ourselves to fulfilling God's commands, loving God with all our heart, loving our neighbor as ourselves, not because we have to, not because our eternal life depends upon it, but because we want to, because our hearts have been changed by God's Holy Spirit. And Paul explains that as we do that, we actually fulfill the intention of the law. He says in verse 14, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. See, in the end, that's what God's Old Testament law is all about. It's how to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's how to love your neighbor as yourself. And so if you love your neighbor, you're not going to murder them or lie to them or steal from them or covet their possessions or any of the other things in the law. Right? You'll tell the truth. 
you'll be good to them, you'll be generous, and so on. But that was not what was going on in the Galatian church. Because as they moved away from the gospel of grace and went to a gospel of moral performance, the result was that they actually stopped loving one another. So verse 15 he says, But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not being consumed by one another. It's ironic, isn't it? That when you, as you focus on moral performance and being a good person, it turns out that you don't end up being that good. But as you believe in the gospel of grace, your life is transformed. See, as you go back to works, you lose the power to love. And instead you find yourself speaking biting, destructive words to fight one another as we vent our frustration and anger. Because it's only the gospel of grace that can change our hearts from within so that we freely love others and bring forth the fruit that God wants. So freedom from the law doesn't mean freedom to sin. It means freedom to love. But we need to understand that the life of love is not something that comes automatically. Uh, point two, there's an inner battle between the flesh and the spirit. There's an inner battle between the flesh and the spirit. So Paul says in verse 16, But I say to you, walk by the spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Our flesh, of course, mean, the word means skin, but it's referring to our, our natural self, our sinful nature. Adam and Eve were created sinless, but they fell into sin, and as they did, our nature was corrupted by sin, so that our natural human state is sinful. And that's why you, you never need to tell, teach someone how to be selfish or greedy or proud or any of those things. They do it naturally. Instead, we have to teach the opposite. We have to have moral classes and things like this. He's saying, instead of giving in to your, your natural instincts, your sinful nature, you need to consciously and intentionally choose the way of God's Spirit as you resist that inherently sinful nature within. And, of course, it's a battle. Because as Christians, our natural self will pull us one way and God's Holy Spirit will pull us another. Uh, John Wesley is the father of the, uh, of the Methodist church, whose theology was in some ways a precursor to the modern charismatic movement. He taught the idea of sinless perfectionism. That is, empowered by God's Holy Spirit, it was possible to live such a victorious Christian life that it was possible to overcome sin totally in your life. Sinless perfection. Uh, the preacher, uh, Charles Spurgeon, famously confronted someone who believed that teaching, who'd claimed to have won their battle over sin. And Spurgeon, to, to prove his point, uh, at one point during the meal, he picked up his glass of water, stood up, and poured it over the other men's head. As you can imagine, he was enraged, and Spurgeon said, I told you that you're not done with sin yet. <laughs> now, Wesley's teaching, it, it runs counter to our daily, daily experience. It, it runs counter to the teaching of these verses. We all know that becoming a Christian doesn't mean that you no longer struggle with sin anymore. Verse 17 says, the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. The desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. See, we're, we're in a spiritual battle. Uh, it would be nice if being Christian meant that churches never experienced any conflict or strife or division anymore. But we know that they do. Right? Because we're in a spiritual struggle. We struggle to be patient and kind and loving instead of impatient and selfish and angry. Now, that's not the spiritual battle or the spiritual struggle that uh, we often think of, right? We often think of you know, battles with demons and Satan and all that. But this is a spiritual battle. 
God dwells in our hearts. We've not yet received our resurrection bodies. And so our mortal bodies still have a sinful nature that constantly pulls us back to our old life, our old ways. And Paul reminds us, if we're truly Christian, if we've received God's spirit, we will actively resist that sinful nature and we will seek to live God's way. Because that's what God promised his Holy Spirit would do. If we go back to the Old Testament to Ezekiel 36, there God's people had stubborn hearts. They'd broken his laws, they'd gone into exile, but God promised a day where he would save them and wash their hearts clean and change them from within by his Holy Spirit. We read this. God says, I will sprinkle clean water on you. You shall be clean from all your uncleannesses and from all your idols I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and to be careful to obey my rules. That prophecy is fulfilled in the Lord Jesus. He dies on the cross for our sins. He's raised again to new life. And at Pentecost, which we remembered a few weeks ago, he pours out his Holy Spirit to wash us clean from all our sins and to change our hearts from within so that now we want to obey him. Not, not in order to save ourselves. He's already saved us. But in response to that wonderful salvation, our hearts change from within. We want to love him. We want to serve others as he's called us to. So that brings us to the final point for today. True believers will crucify the flesh and produce the Spirit's fruit. True believers will crucify the flesh and produce the Spirit's fruit. Now Paul lists out the works of the flesh in verse 19 to 21. The works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. So sexual immorality, wrong sex before marriage, during marriage, or outside of marriage. Impurity means moral filth. Sensuality means uh, pursuing pleasure, usually of a sexual nature. Idolatry, worshipping anything other than God. Sorcery is, includes witchcraft, black magic, all that stuff. Enmity is hostility and hatred towards others. Strife means picking a fight with people. Jealousy is wanting what other people have. Fits of anger is intense uh, displeasure or rage. Uh, rivalries, competing with other people. Dissensions means stirring up divisions among people. Divisions means breaking up into different factions. Uh, envy, drunkenness, orgies, including wild parties, that kind of thing. And Paul ends the list and things like these. So this list is clearly not meant to be exhaustive. And Paul says, if your life or mine is dominated by these kind of traits, then that is evident, evidence that we're not walking by the Spirit. The Spirit is not at work in my life. Because verse 24 says that those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. The Christian actively fights the flesh. They kill their sinful nature, dying to self to live for Christ. That's why Paul says in verse 21, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. We're not saved by our works. Getting to heaven is not about moral performance, but if we've truly put our faith in Jesus and our hearts have been changed by his Holy Spirit, I won't be the same person I used to be. Uh, I, I won't change all at once. It will be a constant struggle and Many times I will fail, and maybe I will commit some of these sins. But if God's Spirit is working in my heart, then gradually, over time, I should expect to see less of the works of the flesh in my life and more of the fruits of the Spirit. 
And so if my life is dominated by these fleshly practices and there's no struggle and there's no desire to change and leave these things behind, then that may show that I'm not yet a Christian, which is why Paul warns such a person will not inherit the kingdom of God. So the Christian who's put their faith in Jesus and received his spirit won't produce, produce that list. They'll produce the fruit of the spirit. We see it in verse 22. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. You'll never find a law that says, uh, don't be loving. Don't be patient with others. You, you won't find that kind of law out there. Now, notice it's fruit. It's not fruits. It's, the Christian is going to grow in all of these qualities, not one. It's not, oh, I'll grow in patience. You can grow in self-control. And, you know, between us, we'll, we'll, we'll live this out. It's one fruit of the Spirit. And notice it's the fruit of the Spirit. Yes, we're responsible for this. Verse 16 tells us, commands us to walk by the Spirit. And verse 25 will say, keep in step with the Spirit. We need to work hard at developing these qualities in my life. It's not let go and let God. But ultimately, it's God's work. It's the Spirit's fruit, the fruit that he will produce in our hearts, as he, uh, in our lives, as he changes our hearts. So love, love for God, love for his people, love for the lost, putting the needs of other people before my own, Joy, the deep happiness that comes from knowing that God loves me and that my eternal future is secure. Peace, peace with God, and of course living at peace with my brothers and sisters. Patience, not impulsive, willing to wait, not always insist on my own way. Kindness, thinking the best of others. Goodness, a generous heart, Faithfulness, I'm trustworthy, person of my word, I do what I say. Gentleness, a humility, courtesy, meekness, self-control. Keep your desires in check. This is what the Christian life should look like. More and more as the Spirit changes our hearts by the gospel. The Spirit and the flesh are incompatible and God has given us his spirit to change our hearts and our lives. So this passage ends with a plea to live God's way. Verse 25 says, if we live by the spirit, if the spirit has brought us new life in Christ, let us also keep in step with the spirit. Let's actively seek to do what he desires and live out a new life in Christ. And Paul gives one Example at the end in verse 26 of what that look, might look like. He says, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Let's not be proud, irritated, uh, irritating others by puffing ourselves up or, or being jealous of them when we don't get what we want or what we think that we deserve. There could be lots of other examples we give apart from that one that Paul gives here. What will it look like for you personally this morning? to seek to serve others in love, joyfully, patiently, kindly, with self-control. Just think briefly, love. How could I put aside my needs to pursue those of my spouse and my children? Joy. How could I be more thankful to God for what he's done and to others? Peace. How could I work through tensions and pursue reconciliation? Patience. What small thing that irritates me could I overlook instead of getting upset? Kindness. How could I assume the best intentions of others instead of assuming the worst? Faithfulness. How can I make sure I do what I say? Say, for example, on the church roster. Goodness. How could I be more generous to others, say in my giving? Gentleness, how could I speak in a kinder and less blunt way? Self-control, how could I control my sinful desires 
perhaps on the computer, or in how long I spend on social media. It's worth taking time to think and pray that God would slowly be changing my heart and bringing forth his fruit in my life. So one of the marks that someone has been changed by God's spirit, I think too often we focus on spiritual gifts and spiritual experiences, and we forget the much more foundational work of the spirit to bring us to faith in Jesus and to grow his fruit in my life. And we've seen today, freedom from the Lord doesn't mean freedom to sin. There's an inner battle between the flesh and the spirit, and true believers will crucify the flesh and produce the spirit's work. So let me encourage you to take some time, perhaps after church today, to honestly reflect. What dominates in my life? The fruit of the spirit or the works of the flesh? And if you see the fruit of the spirit, give thanks to God, because... That's God's work in your life. He's changing you and pray that you'll keep producing more of that fruit and take some time to think what are the areas you can keep growing, what virtues you can keep pursuing. But if as you reflect, you think, well, actually, I see the works of the flesh in my life, then just remember, the answer is not to try harder. You can't earn your way to heaven by your good works. And moral performance won't make you good anyway. You won't be able to produce the fruit of the Spirit without the Spirit's help. So don't look to yourself. Look again to Jesus. Give up the life of moral performance. Lay your life at the foot of the cross. Ask Jesus to forgive you for your sins, to wash you clean, and pray that he would give you his Spirit to change your heart from within, so that you no longer live in that old way anymore, but you live for Jesus and produce the Spirit's fruit. So will you take some time to reflect, and may God continue to transform us to live how he desires. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit that we may turn to Christ in faith and have our lives transformed. By your Spirit, help us to crucify our flesh with its sinful desires. Help us to abound more and more in the fruit of your Spirit. Change our hearts that we may be more like the Lord Jesus and glorify you in response to the salvation you have given us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.